confidence sessions uh, together. Uh, one of those relates to court capacity uh, and the other uh, relates to, to legal aid. And because there's quite an overlap of potential witnesses uh, and a number of the uh, relevant issues, we've decided to, to hold the two uh, evidence sessions jointly, uh, but then um, produce individual reports for the two inquiries in due course. So that's how we're going to uh, approach it. Um, I'll just introduce our panels of witnesses. We've got two panels in a moment, uh, but uh, first of all, the members of the committee, for those who aren't familiar, have to make declarations of interest at the beginning of each uh, committee meeting. Uh, I'm a non-practicing barrister uh, and a consultant to a law firm. Uh, let me go through the members who I can see. Uh, Rob Butler. Thank you, Chairman. Prior to my election, I was a magistrate. I was the magistrate member of the Sentencing Council and I was the non-executive director of HMPPS. Uh, James Daly. Thank you, Chair. I'm a practising solicitor and partner in a firm of solicitors. Uh, Sarah Dines. Have we got Sarah with us yet? Not yet. Um, Sarah is a, is a barrister, uh, not currently practising, hasn't practised since the general uh, election. I can say that for her. Uh, Maria Eagle. Chair, I am a non-practising solicitor. OK. Uh, and I don't think uh, any of the other members that we're expecting have any declarations. Expect Sorry? Oh, and Kenny, oh, Kenny, uh, Kenny McCaskill, who will be joining us later, uh, uh, was a form, formerly is a former solicitor in Scotland, and Kenny's with us now as well. OK. So I, I hope that's dealt with all the relevant declarations of interest. Can I then move in on to uh, our first panel, um, which is going to deal with some of the modelling uh, that has informed some of our inquiry and other matters. And so perhaps I can ask uh, uh, Mr Pope and uh, Ms uh, Desroche to uh, introduce themselves. Thomas and, uh, you, and Caroline. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Thomas Pope, Senior Economist at the Institute for Government. Uh, we're a non-partisan think tank trying to make government work more effectively, and we've been doing work across a series of public services over the last few years through our performance tracker work and more recently have been doing work in particular on the courts and the criminal justice system. Th thanks very much. Um, and Kalyane? Yes, hi, my name is Kalyane Desroches. I'm a Strategy and Insight Manager at, criminal, at uh, Crest Advisory. We're a specialised criminal justice consultancy and we have been commissioned by the Hadley Trust to carry out some research to understand the impact and legacy of COVID on the whole criminal justice system. And as part of that research, we have done some modeling, which has been the substance of our submission. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. That's very, that, that, that's very helpful. Um, perhaps you could just help me, the Hadley Trust who commissioned your work. Um, uh, yes, they a charitable correct. body? Uh, what, what was yes, they are a charitable body who commission research from uh, a variety of institutions, think tanks and ourselves. In the criminal justice field or other fields? In the criminal justice field mainly, yes. Okay, fine, thanks. Uh, and Crest, I think, um, also do work in the criminal justice field, is there? Yes, absolutely. That is a, our main field your, your of main activity. Part of work, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. Th thanks very much. Well, well, what I'd be interested uh, if you to do is if you could just very briefly uh, tell me, um, Thomas, uh, the basis upon which you did your inquiry uh, and the time frame in which you collected the evidence. Of, of course. So we we actually started work in on thinking about pressures on the criminal justice system early last year yeah. and the, at the beginning of our inquiry we were mainly thinking about the impact of additional police officers and additional funding upstream if you like in the criminal justice system and how that was going to feed through um, in the middle of our analysis um, events somewhat took over and the coronavirus um, crisis struck and so we then um, supplemented that analysis to think about how the coronavirus was likely to impact the courts. We made a series of assumptions um, for our initial piece of work, which was in April. And obviously at that point, there was a lot of uncertainty about exactly how the crisis was going to affect the courts. Since then, we've continued to update our analysis um, based on the timely, relatively timely data that's come out of HMCTS that have given Okay. month by month sort of weekly updates on how many cases the mm. courts are processing okay uh, and what's the basis of the assumptions that you made you said you made a series of assumptions what were they so the the main the main assumptions related to coronavirus so 
what, what we looked at there was thinking about what's going to happen to the number of cases coming into the courts and how badly affected will the court be in its ability to dispose of those cases. Um, we assumed that the number of cases coming into the um, courts would fall by roughly 20% in our main scenario. That seems more or less consistent with what we've seen in the data so far. And then we had some we, we had a couple of different scenarios based on how long the crisis might last. Unfortunately, both of our scenarios in April on that basis have proved to be a bit optimistic. Right. We have a, a three month scenario and a six month scenario. Obviously okay. we're, we're still here, but what we distinguish, we, we distinguish between cases that do require juries and cases that don't. And we assumed that um, cases which do require a jury, it wouldn't be possible to um, to process more than about half of those cases. And we assumed that um, you'd be able to process up to 80% of, of the other cases. But that's in our central scenario. We had a sort of sensitivity e either side around that. But as I say, we've continued to update our analysis based on the latest figures. And so we can talk about you know, if, if things continue as they did, say in November, where would we be? Okay, thank you very much. And Callum, when you, you published your report in October of last year, um, yes, when did absolutely. you do the data gathering from that and are any particular assumptions yeah. on the basis of your modelling? Absolutely. We did the data gathering from March to through to July um, and uh, there are bits of data that were gathered in August. So um, also we, our data is historical and we've been referring back to data from 2014 to try and understand what the dynamics within the system are and what the baked in relationships have been prior to this. Okay, thanks very much. Well then, if perhaps both of you could just set out uh, your assessment of the, the, the current levels of capacity uh, for the criminal courts. Sure, should I, should I go first? Yes, yeah, whoever, don't mind. Yeah. Um, so if, if we talk first about the um, wh where we are now, gi given sort of nine months of coronavirus and, and where the system is, I think um, our, our analysis is relating specifically to the criminal courts. And I think it's important to tell two stories here, one on the magistrates' courts yeah. and one on the Crown. Um, so in the magistrates' courts, initially, backlogs increased quite quickly as the pandemic hit, as the ability of the courts to process cases was uh, severely d diminished. Actually, the magistrates' court has been very successful at getting capacity up to not quite where it was before the pandemic, but not far um, from it. And that means that the backlog in the magistrates court has actually been falling since August right? um, at the end of November which is the latest figures that we have from HMCCS um, the backlog was about 18 percent above pre-pandemic levels so a significant increase but um, it's in a relatively stable place uh, the, the crown court unfortunately is a different story largely because jury trials are much harder to um, to do under social distancing and also not possible to do virtually so the uh, backlog in the Crown Court um, is now 53,000. That's up from 39,000 before the pandemic. Now, that's not quite the, the worst level that um, the backlog has ever been um, on those sort of just looking at the raw numbers. But unfortunately, 53,000 understates the scale of the problem. And that's because not all cases that go to the Crown Court require a jury. In fact, um, only about 20% do but they account for almost all of the hearing time. Um, so jury trials are the minority of cases, but they take up more than 70% of hearing time. So what we've done in our analysis is adjusted that backlog to account for the fact that it will include more cases requiring juries than a regular backlog. And if you compare on a like-to-like -like basis, um, the current backlog is the equivalent of closer to 70,000 rather than 53,000. And that is a significantly worse position than we have ever been in before. And I'm afraid the, um, to, to sound a bit more pessimistic, given what has happened over the last few months, so the um, HMCCS had a recovery plan where they hoped they'd be able to do 330 jury trials per week in November. Um, as it happens, they were only able to do 200. Now, I, I sympathize with HMCCS, I think it's a very difficult position they're in but it's quite possible that we're not going to be able to get up to the types of um, levels during the pandemic of jury trials that they were hoping. 
And if that's the case, then for every month of the pandemic continues, and that backlog is going to continue to grow. Yeah. Um, in November, it grew by about 1,000. Um, you could expect it to continue to grow by a similar amount unless it's possible to ramp up capacity okay. even more. Right. Thanks very much. That's helpful. We can explore some of that in a moment. And then Kalyan, from uh, your assessment. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's, it's perhaps helpful if I build on what uh, Thomas has just said. Um, I think we would agree with, yeah. with uh, your assessment largely, Thomas. Right. The thing that we would also say is that this has to be understood within a long-term context where the backlogs both in the Crown Court and in the Magistrate Court were growing and the capacity of both of those courts were already struggling to respond to the demand that was growing. So that's, I think, the first thing to take into account. Yeah. And then the second thing to add to, if we take a slightly longer scale uh, perspective, is that if we consider as our model does, that pressures are going to continue to increase, that demand is going to continue to increase and the inflow into the system is growing, the current rate at which the system is recovering capacity is not enough to stabilize the backlog. Our model shows that even if we recover capacity of 2019 levels by the year, uh, by September 2021, um, if we look at the backlog levels in 2024, we will have an increased backlog in the magistrate courts um, tenfold and an increase in backlog in Crown Court fourfold. So not only are we struggling to reach uh, an equalised capacity now, but this is posing problems for the long term. Okay, thanks. Right, I'm going to hand on then to James Daly for the next set of, uh, to follow up those issues. Thank you very much, Chair. Obviously, thank you very much for that evidence as well. That's very, very helpful. And I, I was going to ask some questions regarding the historical context, but if I could just go to something that you've just said. In terms of the capacity is an interesting word in terms of magistrates. Are we seeing the same... If capacity in the magistrates' courts is sort of evening off and getting back to where we were, are we seeing the same numbers of cases go through the magistrates' courts? Is that what, you, what you're saying to us at this moment in time? So I, I don't have the precise numbers in front of me. I think the the case flow in the magistrates is is still a bit below where it was before the pandemic, but there's at least sort of 80% or so of the cases they were hearing before. And because the inflow into the, the courts is slightly lower as well, um, that's enough that the backlog isn't growing. So but Thomas, can I ask can I ask a question? I'm sorry, this is this is my ignorance, not rather than you've been extremely articulate. So when we're talking about this, if we're talking about fewer cases going actually being charged and therefore going through the magistrates courts, it does still suggest a problem in that the system is not able to deal with the amount of work that it had prior to the pandemic. Would would that be a, a, a perhaps a naive but correct view on that? Yeah, I, I, th I think that, that's a fair assessment. And I think actually when, when we're thinking about co court capacity, it's probably helpful to distinguish between what can the courts reasonably do while social distancing is in place and while we're in the midst of the pandemic? And then secondly, what is its ability to scale up um, over the next year, two years, once the social distancing has passed? How, how hot could we run the courts effectively to um, deal with any future pressures and to deal with the um, COVID-related backlog? If you can't ask, answer this question, and please say, because it may be outside the scope of your research, one of the things that concerns me regarding the courts is the use of release under investigation, which is a Home Office prerogative. But one of the things that clearly is happening within the system at this moment in time is that cases that would normally be, well, should we say I've got a better chance of being charged, are sort of parked uh, in the release under investigation. And I just wondered if, you'd, if there was any academic research that you're aware of what you've carried out about the impact of this work that is sitting there and when that is actually going to come into the court system, if ever. I think you, you picked on what is one of the really interesting kind of unknowns at the moment for the next few years. As you say, release under investigation has been used extensively over the last few years. And um, I, I'm not aware of any academic research. Not, I, as far as I think we just don't know, and it's a big uncertainty about future demands on the courts is, is that work effectively going to be you know, forgotten? Most of it's not going to end up being charged. The cases will quietly be dropped. Or is this actually an additional backlog earlier in the criminal justice system that we're going to have to deal with over the next few years? I think that's a really important question. And I don't think 
I, I certainly don't know the answer to that one. Okay. Uh, can I just ask one final question in respect of Crown Court uh, capacity? Are you saying to us that what does the evidence suggest? And I'm not, you know, I think if you're able to give an opinion on this, that would be very helpful. Does the opinion, does the evidence suggest that as we, for the, if we remain in the pandemic period, if I don't know how long that's going to be, we have to increase capacity to deal with the issues in the in the Crown Court. The Crown Court estate, as it is at this moment in time does not appear to be able to deal with the amount of work that's going through. And we are going to leave ourselves if this situation continues with some very severe delays, probably to years in terms of cases from charge to trial. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's right. At the moment, every, every month that things continue as they are, the backlog in the Crown Court is growing quite considerably. And that means mm. more delays for the, the cases that are being heard now, for cases that uh, will come in the future, yes. Okay, can I just move on to Callie? Can I ask a question regarding the other pressure? So we've, we've got the general picture regarding, you know, the bigger picture regarding cases and, and mm -hmm. things going through. What, have you done, is, is there any sort of academic research in terms of what you've seen in terms of other issues within the court system which are perhaps uh, putting pressure on the capacity of either the magistrates or the Crown Court to deal with matters? I mean, what, just as a, a practical example, there's no way around this. So this is just... It, the use, the increased use of remote hearings, very good. You know, nobody can dispute that in terms of protecting people within the court environment. But the very, the, that increased use obviously impacts capacity in terms of the time it takes to do a single case. I mean, cases that I would have, I was a, a criminal defence list in a previous life. Cases I would have done with a, should say somebody in the court may have taken 10 minutes. I'm told they're now taking an hour to do it, you know, through nobody's fault. And I just wonder if, if you've got any views on that. Um, that's a good question, and the, the question of wider pressures is a, is a really important one. I think one of the things to add to what Tom has said in terms of wider pressures coming in is also the fact that the cases that are coming into the Crown Court are increasing in complexity and in severity and are projected to continue to do so over the next five years. So we're coming with cases that require more evidence, more um, preparation, etc. Um, the second to answer your question on the complexity and other things that are happening within the court, our model does not uh, differentiate between the different types of capacity, but we have done um, research by interviewing practitioners. And what we are hearing is that there are issues around um, coherence across the system, around listing, around information sharing, around, as you say, moving online, there's a strong need for all of this to be evaluated. There may be some impacts on procedural fairness and access to justice, um, both positive and negative. Um, I, yeah, I hope that's answered your question. Absolutely has. And final question for me, Kelly. I think it was yourself who said that the research got, took into account data from 2014. Yes. Is that, is that correct? If it is possible, and obviously, you know, if you couldn't um, give us a, just a brief outline, the picture in 2014 com compared to the picture where we are now or whatever date mm. in the past, can you just give us a flavour of the historical context of where we are? Yes, I will try to paint that. Um, what should be said is that over the course of the past 10 years, there have been closures both in Crown Courts and in Magistrate Courts. There had been a trend of decrease in the volume of crime, but also there had been a perception of decrease in the severity of crime. Um, there had been a reduction of um, resources in a variety of agencies. And essentially from 2014 is when we start to see the trend reversing, when we start to see serious offences like um, sexual offences and violence against the person to start increasing again. From 2014 as well, we can see that timeliness within the criminal justice system from offence to completion has gone up. So what that means is that the timeliness between offence to charge, to charge to first hearing, first hearing to sentencing, sentencing to completion, all of those measures have increased across time. Um, and I, as you said, that is a, a reflection of some complexities within the system itself, as well as pressures with demand and resources. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chair. Thank you very and much. Sorry, may I add something James, to your, your question about what it would take to uh, resolve the Crown Court backlog? Yeah. What our model suggests is that actually um, it would take a doubling of resources from a 2019 base at that point in order to stabilise the backlog over the next three years. Just, just clarify what you mean by resources. Do you mean in terms of court capacity or do you mean what, what 
what we mean is, is the ability for cases to flow through the court from entrance to disposal. And there are a number of ways with which that can be done. As you said yourself, that could be court capacity, that could be judicial capacity, that could be innovation in um, use of technology and online uh, video uh, use of, for trials, etc. But the whole result of that needs to be a doubling of throughput through the courts in order to stabilise the backlog. And thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Are, are you able, then, to give us any um, assessment as to how long it might be able to, to get them back to the... Uh, 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 to get the Crown Court magistrates back to sustainable levels? Because um, we all know that or, or there will always be a pipeline of cases, just out, uh, out of necessity, in fact, as things work through the system. So it's, uh, it's never going to be without a pipeline, but uh, there's a difference between that which is sustainable and still enables cases to come to trial swiftly and be disposed of and what we seem to have at the moment. Can you help us around that at all? Yes, absolutely. What the model shows is that that depends uh, on the rate with which resources is injected within the system. So if we are able to double our court capacity from September 2021 mm. within the course of a few years, then it will. We, the model suggests that we can come back to a stabilised backlog and a manageable backlog by the end of 2023. But if you inject a resource at a faster level, then you'll be able to bring that backlog down more quickly. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, Thomas, do you want to add to that, or you have you broadly agree with that? Oh, sorry, I, I should probably highlight at this point that our, our model and, and the Crest one do differ a little bit in um, not not so much the the impact of COVID, but more on the expectation of how much yeah. pressures over the next few years will impact the court. Yes. So we're not quite as pessimistic no. as well, what, what's um, your assessment then so so our, our assessment is that um the additional police officers and additional support for the cps will mean more cases mm. required but it so at twenty thousand police officers is roughly a 15 percent increase in the number of police officers um in, in our model we assume in our central scenario that will lead roughly to a 15 percent increase in the number of cases that um, needs to be heard and therefore very, very approximately you know, a 15% increase in, well, quite precisely, a 15% increase in um, the capacity required in the courts and by 2023. Um, so not, not quite as big as the, uh, as the doubling, so it's still more resource than, than where we are at the moment. In terms of how quickly you can get back to sustainable levels, uh, that does depend on, as, as Callian says, how quickly, how quickly you're able to ramp up capacity. I mean, one thing to note is that the courts were running at a much lower level in 2019 than they were even in 2015 or 2016. So in 2019-20, there were only 82,000 sitting dates in the Crown Courts. There were 110,000 sitting dates in 2015-16. So if we could just get back to that level, um, then I think um, over two and a half to three years, depending on how big the um, additional uh, sort of additional pressures down the line where we could probably eliminate a fair bit of the coronavirus okay. backlog. Um, so I, I think it's important to have in mind that at 2019 we weren't at the limits of what the courts could do. You know, even, even in more recent years we've done more, but it's really been a government yep. decision to not process as many cases as it could, partly because demand from the rest of the system was lower uh, because police resources and CPS resources were stretched too. OK. Right. Well, we do know that the Ministry of Justice have uh, told us that uh, the spending review that was uh, announced um, allocates £275 million pounds, uh, of extra uh, funding to deal with um, the impact of the extra police officers being recruited and to reduce uh, backlogs. Can you give any, uh, do you have any view as to, to where that sum sits as against the quantum that you think might be necessary, either of you? I'm afraid that's beyond the scope of, of our research. Okay, so you can't. Fair. Thomas? Um, so so we, we did look in our, in our April report at um, the amount of extra resource you'd need to, to deal with the extra police officers. Um, I don't have precise numbers to hand now. I, I can provide those. To okay, if, you, if you're able to, yeah, yeah. For, for both um, of you, um, if you need to come back with any additional... Uh, data but I think we, we are there restricted uh, by what we actually know from HMCTS yep. because we, we only get given a Answer. budget for all of HMCTS, not split between criminal and, okay. um, and civil uh, okay. cases. So 
we've made some assumptions to get all to right. our number, but um, okay. there, there will be caveats around that based on what we all, know. All from right. the, um, the, the other thing that we've heard about future demand um, from the Lord Chief Justice, amongst others, it relates to the number of complex, multi-handed, serious crime cases that are likely to come into the system, which haven't yet um, uh, certainly reached the Crown Court, uh, mm -hmm. may or may not have reached uh, the stage where they come to the, to the Crown Court for initial hearings. Uh, 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 you're aware of those, I can see both of you nodding. Uh, are you able to, to make any allowance in any of your modelling for those or, or, or not? I think perhaps that's one of the things that uh, may explain some of the differences between our model and um, Thomas's, is that we are looking at, we've tried to project the increase of cases by offence type. And what we're seeing based on the trends from 2014 onwards is an increase in more serious cases that themselves have a higher rate, a uh, higher charge rate which means that you're likely to have more complex and more severe cases coming into the courts. Yeah. Essentially, we have assumed that this would be in proportion with the increase of more severe cases coming in at the police level. Okay. And I think this is what explains the fact that our model projects that right. you need so you, more... You, you're saying you think you've tried to take that into account to that degree? Yes, okay. exactly. Okay, Thomas? So yeah, I, I think it, there are two things that are important with the with the complex crimes. I think what, one is the fact that they're um, that, that they take more police time, and so often there's a longer period between the offence and it being brought to court. And then once it's in the court system, the hearings themselves tend to take longer. And over yep. the past um, yep. since, since around 2013, 2014, the, there's been about a, a 15 to 20 percent increase in the average hearing time. In the crown court now actually we saw that level off a bit in 2019 and so in, in our model we both um we, we have a scenario in which that's um you know we, we've reached a new level of complexity and it levels off yeah. and we also have another scenario in which um it increases okay. it continues to increase and that that would add another um five percent or so to the or five or ten percent or so to the amount of um capacity that the crown court was would need of course i mean double hand or multi handers in particular pose a specific problem during COVID that it's hard enough to find the space to to fit a jury and um, a judge and barristers in a in in place yeah. for a single defendant and it's even harder with those multi hands and so my understanding is that um those cases are even less likely to be being heard and therefore they're in the backlog and because they tend to take longer than average to hear that means that the backlog is even more complex and be even more difficult to shift sure. than you might otherwise assume. Okay. The fun thing I was going to ask um, uh, was, uh, we've got your modelling uh, from each of your two organisations. You've explained the, site, the variations that there are between those approaches. We've also got the projections based on the modelling by the Ministry itself. Um, can you comment about why you think um, yours are different from theirs and what the difference in the modelling is that may give rise to that? So the, um, the, the MOJ um, modelling makes fairly similar assumptions um, compared with our police model, that they, they broadly assume that the number of charges increases with um, the number of police officers. Um, the, the main difference between our model and their model is the, um, the sort of bounds, the higher and lower bound, where we, um, we, we have slightly narrower bounds than they do, but broadly our model, which um, was produced some time before theirs, is, is fairly, um, the, the, the kind of, the base assumption is fairly similar um, across the two models. Mm. Um, I, I would agree with that. I think for us, the, the main difference that has been discussed has been the impact of increase in police officers on charged okay. crime and the fact that we have factored in a long-term increase in police recorded crime that existed pre-COVID and that was a trajectory anyhow. Okay. Right. okay. Thanks very much. Um, Sarah Dines. Thank you, Chairman. It's a question to Quest, really. Um, in relation to the suggestion that capacity needs to double, can you give a greater explanation for that? Because there are efficiencies and upping the amount of throughput that doesn't necessarily mean um, physical capacity needs to be doubled. Can you just give further clarification, please? I'd be very grateful. 
Yes, absolutely. And you're right. Uh, when we mentioned an inc a doubling in capacity, what we mean is a doubling in throughput of cases that go through the court from receipt all the way to disposal and to successful disposal. And that can be achieved by efficiencies that can be achieved by, as I said earlier, use greater use of technology. Um, that is the main lever and the main importance is that throughput increases and the means how can be varied and adjusted over time to what is possible based on pandemic conditions. A follow up on that, do you foresee any um, reduction in the quality of that um, case is being disposed of in terms of the experience of both um, uh, both sides, the prosecution and the defence? Is there going to be any compromise made in um, upping that throughput? I think I can speak for what we have seen so far. And what we have seen so far is that um, timeliness has certainly affected the quality of evidence in terms of uh, the experience of victims and witnesses, and it has also affected the experience of defendants in terms of access to justice, procedural fairness, but also delays in um, uh, establishing their lives. And at the moment, there is nothing to suggest that the situation will change for the better unless we manage to stabilise the backlog. Do you foresee any um, potential for extra appeals, for example? because of the way the system has to be compromised in some ways due to COVID? I'm afraid I don't think I, I would like to comment on that. That's too detailed for the um, level of modelling that we have done. But certainly what we can say is that in cases have been more complex and uh, partners across the agencies have found it more difficult to get to satisfactory results as a general rule. Thank you. If I could move on to the Nightingale courts, please, and the COVID operating hours. How, in your view, have the hours increased and what do you think has made the, the capacity increased and what do you think has made the biggest difference um, in expanding the capacity of the criminal courts? Well, I, I think this is something where we, we currently lack enough data and evidence to be able to say anything firmly. Um, so with the Nightingale courts, um, my, my understanding is that they're not holding very much um, crown business at all, and so certainly not many trials because they haven't got the necessary infrastructure to do so. So their their main their main contribution to criminal court capacity has been to move other cases out so that there's more space in the existing court estates um, for those trials. Um, I'm afraid I, I haven't seen very much data recently on on ha how extensively they're being used. Um, the, the only data we really have is the is the high level data of how many trial cases are being disposed of, which is much lower than HMCCS hopes they would be able to achieve um, as of the end of last year. Um, in, t in terms of the COVID operating hours, similarly, there has been um, some analysis of the uh, of, of the early trials, but they haven't really assessed. Um, how much more effective the hours are at, at generating more cases. I know that um, some some lawyers have been, and I'm sure you'll hear in your future session, have been skeptical about uh, how how many how many more cases you can actually hear um, under COVID operating hours. As I say, there, there hasn't been a, a thorough assessment um, that I've seen. Um, I, I think one, one thing that I've heard is that the any improvement in the number of hours or in the number of cases that are being heard has been more efficient listing as much as the hours themselves uh, leading to more cases being heard. Okay. Thank you. All right. Th 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 thanks very much. Rob Butler. Thank you very much, um, Chairman. I wonder if I could turn a little bit to your analysis of um, magistrates' uh, courts uh, and, and some of the implications that flow from it. You, you talked um, at the outset um, uh, in your first response to the Chairman about uh, the, 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 the raw uh, figures. I wonder if you've done any analysis, either of you, uh, in your modelling of the efficiency of, of, of magistrates courts, uh, either pre-COVID or during COVID, in terms of cases that are processed and, and whether any of that has been broken down, for example, comparing um, cases that are heard by district judges as opposed to cases heard by lay magistrates, or whether you've been able to find anything, for example, about what, what I might call dead time. So as a, as a magistrate, we'd frequently find ourselves sitting in the retiring room waiting for cases to be ready. And I'm not putting blame on anybody, not least my um, 
uh, colleagues uh, in the legal profession who sit on this committee. Um, but uh, you know, there, there, there can be all sorts of reasons that things don't happen. Has that come into the ambit of your, uh, of your modeling or your investigations at all? So I agree that those are really important questions, in particular as we're thinking about how can the courts process more cases, a really important question is can they be doing more with the, the time and resources they already have. Unfortunately, data for the magistrates courts is, is worse um, than it is for the Crown courts. Um, we'd like more information in the Crown courts as well, but um, for the magistrate court, we really don't know very much about what is going on inside. We, we know that there's been um, greater use of, um, of judges hearing cases in the magistrates in, or, only, or panels of only two magistrates hearing cases um, in the last few years, largely because the number of magistrates has fallen. That This is a, more of a, a pre-COVID story. Um, I suppose that, that might technically be considered more efficient, but obviously there are lots of concerns there about the quality of justice and, and the implications there. So, I'm afraid I don't know much more about what's going on in magistrates' courts based on the data. I would agree. Yes, I would agree with Thomas in terms of the um, availability of the data and the granularity of the data that we would need to be able to answer your, your question fully. What we can say is that if we look at timeliness as a proxy for efficiency, timeliness has been increasing across certain types of cases and, and that has as Thomas said, that was a trend before COVID hit. So we can only assume that COVID has been a challenge in that respect as well. Uh, I so wonder sorry, if I, might... sorry, sorry. I, just, I should just add that um, the, the introduction of the single justice procedure and um, the ability to hear many summary cases not in, in the courtroom and in court time has been a, a big improvement in efficiency in the court. I, I don't know what it has done to the um, quality of justice in those cases. That's obviously something that a, you can't see in the data, but I mean, I think that was both something that did improve the the way we process those cases, and also has probably been quite helpful in continuing to process those cases during COVID, and um, because it's um, requires one magistrate and a legal advisor um, in a room to to do that, rather than requiring people to come to court and requiring the use of courtroom time. So I think that that is a notable efficiency improvement in the magistrates over the last few years. Yeah, and I, I think particularly on that that latter one, having having done single justice procedure myself, the, the other concern that, that exists, of course, is about transparency, because as, as you said, when it's not COVID, it's, it's, it's the magistrate and the legal advisor sitting in a room, there's, there's no media or public access, so that, that's obviously another factor that doesn't sit within the, the raw definition of, of efficiency. Uh, I, I, I wonder whether I, I could be so bold, Chair Minister, to invite both our, yeah. uh, our witnesses to almost itemise the sort of additional information that it would be helpful okay, to get yes. from the Magistrates Court, not, not here and now, but perhaps yeah, sure. in writing, because yeah. that may well fe uh, feature in, in what, uh, what, what we find, because if we don't know what we don't know, um, it, it's hard to make assessments. So if, if I may be so bold as to make that, that suggestion. Um, I just wonder whether you think that um, there is anything in the potential solutions that have been proposed uh, in terms of allowing, for example, magistrates to hear a wider range of cases. Um, you, you may be aware that, for example, the Magistrates Association has expressed an interest in being allowed to hear cases where the ultimate sentence could be up to 12 months in custody rather than six months at, at present. Have either of you done any modelling around what implication that could have on on capacity which would then of course also impact the crown court because that would mean fewer cases going to the crown court so I, thomas i'll let you go thank you um yeah so what what we do know is if, if you look at the the people who are being sentenced to and that are being required to go to prison there are a lot more short sentences than there are long ones so even if you only took say the the set of um people who are sentenced to six to 12 months, or I suppose it'd be slightly less than that, it's people who's, who could be only sentenced up to 12 months. That would still be, you know, it would not be nowhere near the majority of the cases that they're hearing in the Crown Court, but it would be more than it sounds. And so I think it, it would make some difference there. I really don't think that um, kind of as an, as an economist and an analyst, I'm in a position to say when it is right that someone is heard by, by a jury and when that's only required by magistrates. I would point out that um, in England, we make more use of trial by jury than in other countries. So for example, in 
New Zealand, you're only guaranteed trial by jury for if you could be sentenced to more than 48 months in prison, for example. So it's not the case that this is a rule that applies around the world, but that's not to say that uh, England has the wrong approach and New Zealand has the right one, or indeed what, what other country, what other position other countries are. Because we, re we rely more on trial by jury than other countries, that has put us in a slightly more difficult position in this pandemic where trials by jury are the hardest thing to, um, to hear. But as I say, I, I make no presumption there about what the, what the right answer is. I think there are big questions about what we mean by, um, you know, by the, the rule of law and what we consider to be an appropriate use of juries that goes beyond my remit. Sure. Is there Osh, anything you wanted to add to that? The only thing I would add to that in terms of um, the trials by jury is we, in the course of this work, we've also done some citizens' juries to try and understand what the public's opinion was. And consistently, one of the main uh, things that came up as a consensus, and that's rare um, when you talk to the public about the criminal justice system, was that the right to a trial by your peers and with jury it was incredibly important. So um, as, as Thomas said, there is an element that is practical, and I think there's an extremely sensitive element here in terms of the public's opinion. Yeah. Do you think, uh, either of you, that there's anything more that could be done, aside from talking about trials, that could enable the magistrates' courts to reduce the, the burden on the Crown Court, or indeed to, to increase their capacity themselves? So thinking of, for example, more effective use of, of technology or, or, or different uh, hours, um, you know, is there anything that occurs to you from your perspectives that, that, that could help here? I think one of the things that our model shows is that there are three big levers, um, one of which is to increase capacity in the courts. The second one is to decrease demand on the courts in the first place, and that would actually mean increased prevention and diversion um, early on. I think all of this problem needs to be taken as a whole system approach. Uh, indeed, the, the courts are a bottleneck, and if you change the behaviour of the courts, then you have a change behaviour on uh, probation and prisons. And in this case, in addition to getting more efficiency and um, the small changes that we can make within courts, if we're able to decrease the inflow coming in at the beginning with effective and robust diversion, then um, not only do you support the magistrate court, but you also support the Crown Court. Mr. Pope? Yeah, I, th I think that, um, as I pointed out from the, from the data so far, it seems like the magistrates are already doing quite a good job of at least processing their work um I, I think that anything the magistrates could do to assist the crown courts would would have to be something they were directed to do um by, by others rather than something they'd have the power to to choose to do themselves if, if that makes sense so i think that you know if, if there are things that they could do to to take on some more of the work um in, in the crown court then that would clearly help from a purely processing cases perspective, although it may not be the right answer from a, um, from a legal perspective. Thank you both very much. Fascinating. Thank you. OK. Thank, uh, thanks very much. Out of interest, do, do New Zealand have lay magistrates or a paid, uh, entirely paid judiciary? Do you know, Thomas? Um, that, that's a good question. I'm afraid it's one that I don't know. This is, um, okay. I'm, I'm referring to work by the right. um, Centre of Justice Innovation who have done, okay. who have been looking at what other countries are doing. Fair, fair, fair enough. Uh, Paula Barker and then Kenny McCaskill. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to our witnesses for uh, being with us today. Um, obviously, you've, you've talked about um, the backlogs in, in the Crown and the Magistrates' Courts and the complexity of those cases. And I'd just be interested to understand in your analysis if there's been any particular types of cases that you've come across that are posing particular capacity issues? And if so, uh, would you say that they require specific solutions? Who wants to um, go first? Yeah. No. yeah, off you go. It's, thank you. Um, in terms of modelling, uh, what I would say is that our model takes a, a more high level approach. And because we look at offence types, we will have certain offence types that have more um, severe cases within them, but I'm not talking at a very granular level here. What we do see is that um, se cases that are of a more severe offence type tend to take more time. And so if you wanted to expedite those, there probably could be ways to support that, whether it is more resources or more targeted information. Um, the other thing that I should say is that um, 
over a, well, we have done interviews alongside the model. And what we have heard is that, of course, there are issues in terms of witnesses and victims and defendants giving evidence. And so if you are looking at complex and serious crimes, whether they are multi-handers or um, more complicated such as sexual assault, then there will need to be some uh, accommodations for that in terms of access to video links, access to locations, access to um, specific services as are normally uh, allowed, but during COVID has been difficult, like screens for victims, etc. Just add to that, the, the sort of increase in complexity and average hearing times in the Crown Courts in particular, and um, in the lead up to 2018 and 2019, uh, was driven largely by the increase in sexual assault cases, and they tend to take a lot longer um, largely because defendants are much less likely to plead guilty and therefore you need to have a full trial by jury. So in general, uh, those, those offence types where more people are pleading not guilty are going to take up um, a lot more time. It's also the case that multi-handed trials tend to take a lot of time and there are, um, as I already mentioned, particular COVID-related challenges with, with holding those cases. Okay. Right. Thanks, Thanks very, much. very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think uh, both of uh, you have uh, alluded to some of what you'll probably answer, but it might be appropriate for me to answer specifically. In improving capacity, what role do you think other elements can play in the criminal justice system, in particular statutory agencies and partners such as the CPS and the police? That's an excellent question and certainly key to resolving uh, capacity issues in the long term. Um, in terms of police, the first thing that I should say, as I said earlier, was prevention and diversion. So we have an additional influx of police staff. There can be some decisions made as to where those are deployed, um, what resources are invested in prevention. Um, the CPS interim charging protocol was already put in place in order to decrease the amount of cases that came to court. Uh, that is to say that it raised the bar um, that cases had to pass in order to be charged. So what the CPS and the police can do is decrease demand as much as they can. And once the demand has come into the system, um, treat it what, what tended to be the policy in recent years, i.e. Um, right the first time. So decrease the backwards and forwards with courts and decrease the amount of cracked or um, ineffective trials by increasing the availability of evidence. And that means best use of platform, best information sharing mechanisms, interoperability between IT systems. Um, there's quite a bit that can be done from a practical perspective, but there probably also needs to be uh, policy choices that can be made, whether these are about um, low level crimes, levels at which they can be diverted, investment in out of court disposals, investment in um, robust partnerships with the third sector or with other policy and public sectors. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think that, you know, our, the, the CRAS model and the IFG models give, give quite different answers about, you know, the trajectory that we're on. But I think they're both very useful in telling you that you really do need to think about the criminal justice system as a whole system. And if you're going to be putting more resources upstream into the police and the CPS, and that's clearly going to have implications downstream, I agree that I'm um, thinking about out of court disposal options um, would be a, a good a good thing for the um, perhaps the committee to um, to consider um, as I say from a that, that's from an analyst perspective not from a, a legal perspective um, and I think over the past few years there's there's some evidence that the CPS has become a bit of a bottleneck in the system as well and there's now been more more money was provided for the CPS in spending review 2019 and I think continuing to keep you know, all, all elements of the system well funded I mean the other thing that I would um, just throughout there is that if we're going to be getting significantly more throughput in the in the courts and that also means that we need more capacity in prisons and our prisons are almost um, full as well so I think um, that, that whole system approach um, yeah is, is certainly very important. Thanks very much. Your modelling obviously focuses on criminal justice what uh, if anything if you've had an opportunity can you say about other courts the civil ones? So I think that what our analysis certainly of the COVID crisis has shown is that, you know, it was the, the, the problem in criminal justice related to COVID really has been the inability to hold jury trials. 
and in particular the inability to do those virtually, whereas the magistrates managed to do things virtually quite successfully. Um, so I'm afraid most of our analysis has been on criminal justice, but broadly areas like family where they've been able to move quite a lot of that online and do more of that virtually, I think the impact has been less. My understanding is that the county courts tends to be much more paper-based um, and that, that may have complicated um, doing more of that uh, more of that work, more of the civil work virtually. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid I don't have a, a model to back up. Yeah, yeah, okay. Is there anything to add, Karen? Or? I think in terms of civil courts, um, I would agree with Thomas that our, our research doesn't necessarily translate. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is that the, the most important thing would be to evaluate the use of technology and the impact on victims and mm -hmm. defendants, which will be at a different level of vulnerability, whether we're talking about county courts or family courts, it's, it's quite different cases. Yeah. Okay. Indeed so. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Kenny. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenny. Um, unless any other colleagues have any further questions for our first panel, can I thank you both very much um, for your time and for giving evidence to us. We're very grateful to you. Uh, and if you, you'd like to follow up with those uh, matters that you said you'd come back to us with, um, then we'd be very grateful in due course. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank um, you, Chair, and thank you to the committee.